Hey guys, this is BJ Min, the publisher of How Expert, where we publish quick how-to guides on all topics from A to Z by everyday experts. And today's How Expert of the day is Celis Rivera. Is that how you say your name, by the way? Celis, yeah. How you say it? Celis. It's like Ellie, but with an S. Celi? I yeah. Say slower, kind of. <laughs> okay. So you take Ellie, and then you add S's to the beginning and the end. So it's like Celis. Sales. Okay, I, I did a previous video. I messed up your own names. I'll get rid of that video. Okay. I say sales instead of Sally. Sorry. Okay. Well, anyways, Sally Rivera, and she just recently uh, wrote a book for How Expert called Social Justice Advocacy One on One: How to Become a Social Justice Advocate from A to Z. And I'm gonna read the about the quick bio section written by her uh, very quickly before we start the interview. So, Sally Rivera is a writer with a passion for social justice. She has a Bachelor of Arts in English Writing and Master of Social Work. She has worked and volunteered at organizations focused on a variety of causes, including helping farm workers, the Hispanic and Latin community, and at-risk high school students. She has also been published in magazines and blogs covering different social justice topics, including urban poverty, food and land justice, immigration, and sexual violence on college campuses and in the church. She is grateful for the opportunity How Expert has given her to share her knowledge of, that, of the advocacy world that she has accumulated over the years. She also wants to dedicate a special shout out to her friends and family for their support in the creation of this book, whether it was from something as small as cheerleading to as large as editing. You know who you are. Thank you in her own words. To learn more and read more about Celis's work, please visit her website, worthareed2.com. That's W O R T H A R E A D T O O dot com. Worth a read two dot com. Celis, welcome to the quick interview. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. This is a natural interview. Let's uh, just a conversation. So let's just learn about who you are. For, for the people that usually they, before they want to read the book, they want to know who you are, how you got, like one thing that stood out about her. Okay, like every how expert writer as a publisher that I hire, I just told her before this interview started, they are very passionate about their topic. So they don't give me one word answers, one sentence answers when I ask them a question, you know, what are you passionate about? Sell is from the get go, you know, I to be honest with you, we hired like 10 to 15 percent of the people who apply at Upwork, by the way. Um, her answers were very detailed, thorough, and she from the get go knew her topic. Okay, it was social justice. Uh, so, uh, 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 some, some, somewhere along the lines, that was the topic, and we decided let's go with social justice advocacy uh, in that direction. So, who, how did you get into this topic? Uh, first of all, like, and who are you? Can you tell us about yourself? Yeah, and how you got into this topic? Sure, absolutely. And, and be open. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. I mean, I can talk, 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 talk. So, sure. This is gonna be good. All right. Hopefully. <laughs> so, I mean, small <laughs> background. I was born in Puerto Rico. Okay. And then I grew up in, um, oh, spare me one moment. Just my dog is barking. I'm sorry. No worries. Like I said, I'm not there to go with the flow. This is a real way to do it. It's oh, people okay. right. right. with us more when we're real. All right. All right. Well, I have a little dachshund and she's red and we call her ketchup. So she's a little feisty, but she's cute. <laughs> all right. So anyways, um, so I was born in Puerto Rico and I grew up in Massachusetts. So I am bilingual and that's kind of where my love of diversity, I think, started. And then when I came into college, I was studying English because I love writing. And at some point, something didn't feel quite right. Mm. So college, I, in college time, right? I'm sorry? In college time? Yeah, yeah. I was about halfway through my college degree and I had English. I was studying writing and I didn't know what to do with it. All I knew is that I just really loved doing it and something didn't feel right about what I was studying. Huh. Um, I knew I loved English, but I was like, I don't know, like, what am I gonna do? And so I started thinking when this uh, Peace Corps volunteer came to one of our classes and I was like, wow, that's so cool. Like he's making a difference in this world. He's going to different countries, making a real difference. It wasn't just like, you know, just like volunteering here and there. It was like devoting his life to this. And I brought up the idea to my family and they were like, what? Like Peace Corps volunteer? Like you're just gonna drop off the face of the earth for several years? And I was like, okay, let me start baby steps. Um, mm -hmm. That is a little <laughs> broad chain from like English degree, dorming in the comfort of like traveling the world or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to go to the other side of the world. So we're doing that, and then 
my mom brings up from my church a mission trip idea okay. that my denomination was having. So yeah. I applied. I was like, okay, you know, I'll get to travel and it'll be something short for a summer and I can see if I like it. So that's how I found myself in on the Yakima Indian Reservation. In wait, wait, wait. So you went to like a mission trip in that in reservation and yes. Uh, wow. Okay. So completely West Coast. Okay. And I was on a farm for a whole summer. And that's where I started learning about the food and land justice. And that was completely different. That was like, I was living on a trailer, getting up at four or five in the morning to feed the cows and having these youth groups come and like kind of, you know, learning about the Yakima Indian Reservation and what they went through with the white settlers. And then there was a lot of poverty. There was some African-American. There was a lot of Mexican immigrants there too. Hmm. And just learning how food and land justice affects the people, the land, the animals. It was it was really eye opener, especially because I'm also a vegetarian. So I was learning about kind of where food comes from. So that was really cool. Next what year was, comes around, was, I'm just curious, what were the challenges that you noticed that oh my gosh. Yeah, oh. Like some big things. You're like, oh wow, there has yeah. to be a change. With with the food land justice or just kind yeah, of Yeah, whatever that opened your eyes when you had that experience going to that trip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things was definitely disconnecting from technology quite a bit. And, you know, like being outside at night, you I would look up and I'd get dizzy because I could see all the stars, but there, were, there was no light pollution. And you just hear the coyotes off in the background. And it was like there was no difference between the sky and like what was around you. And it was just surrounded by mountains. And I started learning kind of just because I became a vegetarian doesn't mean I was making as much a difference as I could. Because mm. yes, I was saving animals, but what about the farm workers? I wasn't doing mm. anything for their rights. Okay. Because you know, for example, we used to have slavery as a country. Absolutely. African Americans, and then now you know we don't do that. But what can we do? Well, there are immigrants from other countries, specifically Mexico, as one of them, who are working here, and they're not getting paid. If they're undocumented, they're not getting paid the minimum wage. Right. So it's almost like a modern type of slavery. Yeah. So that wasn't. So that was where I got into the farm workers' rights, and that's what I got into. So that was an eye opener that I needed to do more, and not just, not just, you know, volunteer a soup kitchen or right. I'm just going to be a vegetarian, but also do something for others that's going to be in the long run, whether it's rights, the law, organization, something that's going to be a long lasting difference. So, and that's where I started to slowly understand what advocacy was, but it actually wasn't until the next year when I did a second missionary internship. This time I was in the state of Kentucky and okay. I was in Louisville and I was learning about urban poverty there. It's a place called, well, the first was Yakima Christian Mission on okay. Just Living Farm that was in Washington. This one was called Urban Spirit. Huh. in Kentucky and they did poverty simulations and camps for middle schoolers and high schoolers to learn about urban poverty and that one was also pretty eye-opening it was I mean it was exhausting <laughs> to run those things from my end uh, because we had to run everything from behind the scenes so I was always working like around the clock and that one was more about learning you know that charity can only go so far wow you know, it's kind of like the idea of the so okay, wait, wait, wait. what is charity then? What do most people think charity is? This is I don't know this stuff, but well, yeah. here's why I'm gonna explain it. Yeah. yeah. So you know the saying like give a man a fish versus you know, you see feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, you absolutely um you feed him for you know forever. Well, right. this one's you know, charity is more like that. I'm gonna give you this one thing, I'm gonna help you through this right now, but it doesn't make a difference in the long term in the sense that, that problem's gonna come back. Basically, here's a good way to think about it. If tomorrow or next year, or even if at some point in the future, this person's gonna have that problem again, and there's no way to solve it other than you just giving that thing again, that's charity. What are the typical charities that, that most people know of? Just soup kitchens, things like that, or what? Soup kitchens, probably okay. um, thrift stores, okay. you know, okay. giving uh, Salvation Army, donating furniture, giving okay. money on the street, things, which is not to say that that's not important because yeah. that person might need that meal to get to tomorrow. So it's right. not to say don't do that, but it can't be the only thing you do. Good. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. 
So then comes the side of, okay, so we said, um, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Well, what about creating a system where everybody has equal access to the fish and the fish is healthy? And like, and that's where we started talking about advocacy and learning, for example, everybody has some level of privilege, which is just an area where you have some advantage based on some level of your identity. And then some level of oppression where it's some level that you're at a disadvantage Mm -hmm. just because of something about your identity. And it's not to say that, oh, you're better than me or you're worse than me or, um, you know, that you don't have problems just because you have this one thing of privilege or not. It's just to say that that's an area where you ha- you have an advantage where you can help someone who doesn't have that advantage. Hmm, okay, They're I see. just kind of keeping the advantage to yourself. Right, right, right. That's how yeah. that's how it is right now. You know, that's life. Yeah. Yeah, right. right. And so, and, you know, we've we slowly changed that. There's a reason why, you know, we there was several movements. I mean, there have been the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, and there's been so many movements and every time we end wars and all those things, you know, so there's progress, there's progress, but we're still, we're, we can still always make things better. We can always better ourselves as people too. So right. urban poverty, I was learning about how kind of we create a system where we depend on poverty. Hmm. And so that was really interesting. Um, for example, if you think about Walmart as an yeah. example, Yes. Right. Walmart is really cheap, which is really helpful to people who don't make a lot of money. Okay. But they also don't pay you well. They pay very minimum wage. They don't necessarily give a lot of benefits to their employees. The workers. Yeah, no, exactly. So they're creating poverty with them. And then they'll probably end up shopping there. And it's a cycle. And yeah. whoever's getting the money is whoever's the owner of Walmart. <laughs> oh, right, 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 um, right. When Sam Walton, who originally created it, I think he only got he was always careful about only making like I don't don't quote me on the numbers. It was something like 150,000 or something like. Yeah, right. But it might have been different. Um, you know, someone researched this. Whoever's watching it, see if I'm wrong or right. Feel free to tell me. Uh, yeah. But the point is that he wasn't a millionaire. He yeah. he didn't want to be a millionaire. Um, right. But now those owning Walmart, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they can count the money that they have. Right. Um, so that's kind of where that started. So how do poor people create wealth? How do wealthy people create poverty? Right. So it was really fascinating to learn about that. And kind of an eye opener to me because as a Hispanic woman, I kind of always focused on areas where I was disadvantaged when I didn't yeah. think about areas where I was advantaged. Like I have an education, I am middle class, um, I'm very healthy physically. And so that's kind of where that grew. And from there, whew, then I started studying social work and oh my gosh, I started learning a lot about it. Hey, you got a master's in social work, right? I did. I did. Yeah, yeah. Afterwards, so some experience after that, and you got into social work, and then and yeah. and what what did yeah, you learn? And from there, I uh, worked at a Hispanic counseling Hispanic counseling um, agency, and then I started. You know, and I volunteered as well. Like I said, to that for the farm worker rights. I also yeah. got an internship at an at risk. At, well, it's not an at risk, but it's a high school that's non traditional and helps students who usually are at risk of just. You know, they, they probably have dropped out of a different school. They had learning disabilities or they just have so many socioeconomic factors that they couldn't graduate in time. And so it was kind of helping them. And that was really stressful. But I also learned a lot with that. Right. And so and then kind of just seeing I liked the one on one because you can see how things going on at the national level, federal level, local level were affecting this one student at a right. student who was on DACA and DACA, I don't know if you know what that is. I think it, I heard of it, but yeah. Yeah, so it's um, it's deferred action for childhood arrivals and it's mm-hmm. for any child who was brought here as you know, a minor by their parents and they were undocumented. Right. Not their fault, uh, but their parents brought them. And so with the new administration that was being taken away, so whoever has the program, it's a two year renewal of deferred deportation. So every two years, you can work and you can study, but yeah. that's it. You know, you're not a citizen. You're just right. a legal resident to do that for those two years. And then you reapply. And huh. so right now we're in a place where you can maintain it if you have it, but you can't get one if you've never had it before. And that student. You can't, you can't get a new, you can't renew it right now. You can renew it, but yeah. if you've never had it, you can't apply it for it. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah. So you can, just because it right now it's in a limbo. Right, the, right, right. The administration right now, the Trump administration, and so this student, if even if they graduated high school, what were they going to do? They can't go to college because right. they never had DACA. He right, wanted right. to have DACA. Sorry, I, I think I might have said he was on DACA. He never had DACA actually, and he okay. he could have been he could have fit 
the bill, but he never, he couldn't apply in time because by the time he found out and he didn't actually even know he was undocumented until he really? told him. Yeah. Later on when he got older, I guess. When right? he was older and he was a teenager, his parents tell him, he comes to me freaking out and he's like, you know, all my plans are out the window. Like, what am I going to do after high school? I can't go to college. Um, I can't work. You know, I can, he could work at a construction site or work somewhere that, you know, would hire undocumented workers as a farm worker. And so I realized it would, all that stuff would just make me very, very upset. And I realized, really I, yeah. yeah, I realized I had to do something, um, had to do something. So it wasn't just giving a man a fish every day, you know, I see. Um, and so that's kind of where I got active in that. And my, the national association of, of social workers is yeah. an organization that my school would go to advocacy days and I got to get to meet representatives and from there that kind of grew and I started going to local things and like protests and rallies and marches and I would call write letters emails um and from there you know it just kind of grew some of that stuff was even homework honestly <laughs> for really yeah. oh, part, of, part of your graduate school okay yeah for my graduate school I had to write a a letter to one of my representatives so like wow. that's where I kind of that's where I kind of got all and all, all that knowledge that I put into my books I realized there wasn't really anywhere to get a nice friendly guy that kind of gave you everything you had to do it kind of like go through google and all that stuff right all these all these uh tips that you uh, lay out in social justice advocacy 101 right yeah i mean to be honest a lot it's mainly all either from my experience uh, or common sense information that um, you know i made a glossary at the end to help with terms that people should know and to be honest i made them up myself okay. as best no. as I could define. Um, and I use common knowledge as well. The only thing I really Googled was to make sure I was correct. Right, right. Um, you know, like I went on the USA government website um, and then to make sure that I, I was correct about what branches are what in the government. And what I did was I did Google a lot for resources to put at the end. So, so readers can continue their education. They can watch videos, they can read blogs, they can pick up a book and they can kind of continue their their education this is just a way to get their foot in the door and i hope that it puts them off to a great start so after uh graduate school uh, uh, what, what have you been doing like uh, uh just curious what's the end story yeah, so i work at a i work at a, a technical school or vocational school now that is uh, post high school for people interested in the entertainment industry okay to work in the entertainment industry and i work a lot with um the students i'm the coordinator of the students who have problems that might be get, stopping them from coming to school or affecting them financially or things like that. Just curious, what's your future goal? What, what, what is your dream? You know, oh gosh, uh, <laughs> I have a lot, I have a lot. I yeah. definitely want to continue to publish and help people make as much of a difference as I can. I want to, yeah. uh, it'd be great to someday work in the government perhaps. Uh, honestly, yeah. I'm, you know, it might be, I might be interested in teaching. I, I honestly have so many ideas that I'm so, right. uh, or see as far as I can go in the company I'm in. I really do love the school. So I'd love to see where I can go from there. I don't know if I move up, we get promoted. It'd be great. So right, right. <laughs> I have a, you know, all I know is throughout everything, I'm going to continue to write. Right, right. And how did you get such like not everyone has a compassion and passion for you know social justice advocacy? You know, unfortunately, not everyone does. But how did you have so much of that? You know, honestly, it probably comes from my family. My grandma was a social worker. Actually, she passed away last year, and she worked at a school, which really inspired me to where I am now okay. and both my parents are pastors so oh. I think it's just and there's a lot of teachers in my families I think it's just there's this innate culture in my family and we are Christian as well so we have a, a sense of faith and this feeling of I and I were called to make a difference and help others in this world so yeah. I think I just grew up already predisposed to all that and by the time I learned how to do it in my way which was through advocating I kind of found my path. Right, right. And I looked through the book, uh, the ch ch table of contents. What you know, what it pretty much covers is like the tools that you need to make a change uh, through the government, kind of right. But in your own words, how would you uh, describe uh, who this is for and what you teach? Yeah. So I think the book is for anybody who feels like they've been really passionate about an issue, or maybe they're really upset about something going on in our country right now right. and they just have no idea where to even start or what to do and or they think that they can't make a difference because they're just one person and right. I think that what I teach is some of the most basic skills that every advocate should know some uh, basic terms resources uh, 
explain step by step how to do things so you can start as a reader, you can get started. And from there, you can learn to network and you can learn, you know, from my mistakes and just kind of start from there and get your foot in the door and start meeting people and start working and, and getting part of this community because there really is a large advocating community here. Just right. like any cause you're, you're passionate about probably out there and if it's not you can start it and, <laughs> and that's kind of that's kind of what i'm what my goal is you know some people may uh, i think these days like there's uh, the country's so divided you know there's so many people you know one against another you know usually so like we don't understand like i didn't really know about social justice advocacy to be honest with you you know and so we can have our own judgments about that like for me as a guy like social justice warriors there's you know you see that on video and we have prejudgments, you know, but, and it's like, um, my question is like, like how, like it, what is this like, basically like, you know, we, we, we make judgments, but I think it's important to just talk to each other too, you know, understand both sides. And, uh, and, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, you know, I, I feel like for me, it's like one way to change is like, um, I don't know. I, I feel like you could do it on your own too, like even in, in, in small piece of pieces. But from your perspective, what is the most impactful way to make a change out of all the table contests? Like, what's the most impactful way? Sure, absolutely. Relationships. Right. Honestly, it's relationships. And I think you hit a really good point there with the social justice warriors. Yeah. And That's I why actually, I the title is, is that what the book is about too? Like, what? <laughs> Yeah, and so I'd love to explain that. And I, yes. you know, please, I don't. I haven't talked to uh, people like you. That's why I want to understand first. Absolutely you know, no. yeah, yeah. I know it's the same yeah, thing. And we're, yeah, and I want to hear your perspective. So I, I'm educated more, and the people, other people, understand more, and they, they come closer. You know, in a better way, right? That's the ultimate goal. Yeah, absolutely. I think we judge too fast. That's what it is, including yeah, absolutely. myself. Yeah. Absolutely, and and like uh, we had talked about, and and we. You, your suggestion, I thought it was a great idea to dedicate a chapter to that. Yeah. And I went to town with that, the do's and the don'ts in my theory, in my right. opinion, because we think the way to change is, you know, like we like calling out people or, or calling people names or, you know, and there's an article, it's, you know, I can't quite remember the title, but it's something like, you know, there are a way to change people. There's a way to, that will change people's mind, but it's not yelling racist at them or something yes. like that. And I the link from that in my book. And the point is, when you get called a name, you're gonna want to prove that you're not that. Like, wow. no, 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 I'm not, I'm not this, or I'm not that because of X, Y, Z reason. It's not gonna make you stop and reflect. Okay, why? Why do I think that way? So when we build relationships with someone who normally you wouldn't, or someone yeah. who breaks a stereotype for us, or yes. someone who has a different level of privilege or, or oppression, like we were talking about, a different level of advantage, disadvantage, we help each other out. And we can learn from each other's perspectives. Everybody, doesn't matter what opinion you have, there's a reason why you have that. It's because of the way you grew up. Right. So I think what's important to learn from, if, if you learn anything from my book, is that build relationships and relationships where you can have healthy communication. Mm. And with, that's all, where, uh, who, with who? With who? With anybody and everybody. So with government officials. Okay. relationships are key because that's what that's why they're going to remember you if you go into a meeting and you're like here's my list of facts of why you should change this law they're not going to remember that and but if you come in and you tell them the story i'm sure you are you still remember the student i just told you about with the daca situation but you're probably not going to remember the random numbers i've thrown out about walmart you know so <laughs> right, right, right. that's kind of the thing when and i i know representatives who have said you you tell your story and yes have something to back it up but the story is what people are going to remember and then they'll remember the okay let me get that fact back let me look it up again right, uh, right. so relationships with government officials making relationships when you go to rallies or protests or other advocacy events because that creates a community and then just making relationships with people like i said who are who are different uh, you know and you as an um you're, you're a man, I'm a woman, I'm Hispanic, I'm not sure your ethnic identity, but Asian. <laughs> Asian. and uh, we can learn from each other. And right now, exactly what we're doing, it, you're open to learning. But if I were to start yelling things like, oh, you know, because you don't understand me, that I'm sure you're still just going to continue to not understand me. Yeah, right, right, and right. so, and I have this theory, actually, that the, we go from a, like a swinging pendulum, pendulum to, from one spectrum to the other, where there's the extreme of what we've already gone through, 
Mm -hmm. with um, slavery in the past or the way women have been treated in the past, um, the homosexual uh, community in the past, and any kind of in the past. And now we're trying to find a balance, but sometimes yes. people go extreme to the other way. Uh, yeah. Black Lives Matter says, you know, Black Lives Matter too, we matter as well. And one person goes and goes to shoot cops and says, oh, like Black Lives Matter, we're better than white people suddenly that's what sticks in people's mind that one person who went too far when there's right. this whole other community who just wants to be equal and right. i obviously i'm not black i cannot speak for that community but from what i understand you know that's kind of a, an example of that so it's kind of like we need to find that balance and yeah. yelling names at each other or just thinking like oh only you know so people who just say like, oh, well, that's only a problem that, that we have, like, like only women can get raped. That is not true. Men can also get raped. It just statistically has turned out the way it has, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean men who are victims of sexual violence aren't victims of sexual violence. So it, it can get pretty dicey. But when we talk about relationships and we, we have an honest conversation, okay, yeah. how come you have that perspective? What did you go through? And at the same time, respecting ourselves and understanding my level of mental health, if I've gone through so much, if I'm a victim or survivor of a sexual assault, I don't think I could be the person to talk to someone who's a perpetrator. Uh, you know, mm. so, so it's it's kind of finding those people who are in that extreme spectrum, leave them at the extreme spectrum. They're not the people to, to worry about. Mm. Focus on those in between. Some right. people who are similar. Uh, there's a great uh, there's a great um, organization called uh, Showing Up for Racial Justice, right. which is a group, a community of actually people who are white, who support yeah. the Black Lives Matter community, but they do all do all their advocacy to point towards Black Lives Matter instead of speaking for African-American people. Some people might disagree that I, I am white skin, I am white, so um, I'm speaking from my perspective. Someone who's African-American can totally correct me, but from my understanding, that's what that community does. So don't speak for that other person, but point towards them to encourage them to have power. And so that's um, an organization that talked about how there are people um, across the spectrum. And I've heard this in, in many places, but this is just the latest place I can remember. And I've heard this in many places there. Uh, they said, you know, there's people who like Nazi level, like this is the way I believe. And then there's people completely hundred percent on your side, almost too much. And then yeah. there are people in between, and they're the people who are going to be more open to changing their minds. And right, so right. I've heard that from many, many places. Um, I just remember I went to a social justice, uh, social surge, they're called surge, social, showing up for racial justice. I went to one of their meetings and someone just happened to mention it at that meeting, that idea. So um, I wanted to specifically point that out as an example. So that's just yeah. so many different ways how you see relationships are really what advocacy is. And that's yeah. kind of, what I hope people take away from the book. Yeah, I learned a lot today. Just like it's all about communication to develop the real relationships. You know, like me, I didn't know about your topic, but I understand your perspective a lot more now. And, uh, you know, it's useful. I looked at the table of contents. It's tools to help anybody, whatever, you know, they want to, they, whatever their mission is. And uh, that's what I got out of your book, looking at it really quickly. And uh, is there any last things that you want to share um, related to this book or to people like you? How to how to make a difference uh, from what you learned from real life experience going to protests and going to all these stuff like you said relationships anything else absolutely uh, stay optimistic honestly yeah. it's really hard I think because there's so much negativity out there and it's yeah. okay to take some time to do a, new, a news cleanse or like a social media cleanse and and just kind of take care of yourself and recharge because in social work we're always talking about self care self care self care. You take care of yourself. You can't pour from an empty cup. You know, you can't, um, you know, keep giving to some other people when you and depleting your energy and not recharging. So right. trying to change the world. I, my, uh, a past, the pastor from the mission trip that I had, the first one I went to all the way back at the farm, kind of bring this full circle. He would say that we don't work to make a difference in our generation. It's for our children's generation wow. because we want that to be a lasting difference. Um, his name is David Bell. He's a, he's a great man. And so we, you know, we, we, we can sometimes see victories in our lives and that's awesome. But when we'll really see it is for our children's children. And right. that means that even if 
whatever you do, however small, if it's just signing a petition online, if yeah. it's calling and just having to leave a voicemail, something that seems like nobody's noticing the difference, that is at least one more step towards whatever that goal is. And I'm sure at some point, you know, when your children's children are like, this is the norm for us. Hey, yeah. I was part of that community, no matter how small the, my, my contribution was. It's similar to what I, uh, my barber actually told me. He's older the eyes. Than <laughs> Your <me>. barber? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but similar story, kind of I give an analogy. He said, you know what? The fruit that you eat right now, that was planted by uh, someone else uh, with a seed uh, many generations ago. Yeah, true. So it's kind of true. Like you said, so they take one step and, but the person who's eating the fruit, they don't recognize it sometimes, you know, but that's how it is. Once Do the best you can and the, the future generations eat the fruit, you know? Yeah, see, that's actually a perfect example of the privilege thing, the advantage thing that we're talking about. It's sometimes you don't realize Yeah. I've been given that fruit yeah. when there's someone here who doesn't have that fruit or only has half the fruit, you know, and you can share your fruit or, or, or help ease the way so that they have access to get to the tree, you know, that your family had helped build, um, you know, so there's a lot of great analogies, but I think yeah. most people really are open to the idea of, making a difference it's just yes. the way we hear it there's a lot of women for example who, yeah. would, who would identify and support women's rights but they don't like being called a feminist because of just mm. the extreme you'd hear neo yeah. nazi feminists or whatever those stereotypes are and they're like i don't want to burn my bra <laughs> i've never <laughs> that and i call myself a feminist so but it's good to talk to one you know like like men don't talk to you know like this conversation there it doesn't happen enough i feel like you know what i mean and there's nope. a large he for she movement, which is men who support women's rights, men who yeah. are doing like the surge group, yeah. pointing towards the w women who are advocating as opposed to saying like, I'm a man and I can speak for women. Right. So it's 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 there. I think there's yeah. just a lot of negative perspectives when really it's just if we learn to communicate healthily without, you know, I feel this way when you did this or whatever. So, we, we definitely, I think we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving forward, but I think- Work in progress, one step at a time. Exactly, one progress, progress one step at a time. And I hope anybody who feels that way can pick up my book and at least have some key steps they can go back to at any point to, to remember kind of what they can do to get started. Well, I admire your passion, uh, you know, your drive and uh, a mission that you have in, inside of you. I could, I could see it already. And even, you know, I could see in the future, you know, you're gonna keep going up, you know? You have that passion, that fire to do, make a difference. That's that's yeah. very commendable and mild. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I hope to someday maybe publish a memoir where I can kind yeah. of tell my story and hopefully inspire other people because I know I'm sure there have been times I've felt alone and reading books has really helped me. And uh, so I hope that, that that will happen someday and I can, you know, share more of my story. And then I appreciate I'm having I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. I could see it already. Yeah. Exactly. And towards that. So yeah. thank you. Awesome. And if people want to go to your website, it's uh, worth the read read2.com right yes yes so uh, worth a read2.com and that's for you do all the freelancing projects writer pro what kind of projects do you are you interested in doing uh, right. on the side right yeah. i mean i love writing anything social justice related i've written a lot for a magazine called just women which is the one uh, that my actually my domination has nationwide which combines spirituality and social justice for women yeah so that's been pretty cool i've done that a lot for, for different blogs and that's my blog as well the blog's just getting started but i've posted yeah. All the things I've published. I also do creative work. Like I said, uh, my memoir that I've been working on uh, just does cover having a bicultural identity, having a Hispanic and American identity, how being a woman ties into that, how being bisexual ties into that. So that's kind of um, a project that's in the works, but I've I've published little little excerpts of it here and there. Poetry. One last thing. Oh, uh, since people like social media, like, is there any social media platforms that you want to share that other people can follow yeah. after watching this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a Twitter and a Facebook page and they're both just my name at Celis Rivera. So at okay. that sign. No S Instagram? No, no, I <laughs> have not gotten into it. I have to do it for my job and I just don't. Oh. I, I don't know. I just haven't gotten into it. It's That's hard the future. For me to That's the future share. now more than Facebook. I'm just, as yeah, I know. I know. It's just so hard for me to share my writing. I can't think of like how I'm going to share writing links. And things like that on Instagram. Yeah. 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 So I'm probably actually more heavily on Twitter to be honest. Twitter. Okay, Twitter, Twitter. Okay. Yeah. But it's on the at sign then S E L Y S R I V E R A. Cool. And that's my, my social media. handle. Cool. Awesome. And Facebook. And future, maybe Instagram. 
<laughs> right? I, I feel like I recommend it. I recommend it as a marketer. Yes, yeah, maybe something new will come up and we'll have to figure so that out. Grab the name now before it take, gets taken. Right? By the time I get on Instagram, it's probably going to be off to some other thing. <laughs> I feel like. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, thanks for being on this interview, Celis. And uh, I appreciate you. And I wish you the best of success in whatever path you go to. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Cool. Thank you.